Thanks for tuning in to Talking Point. I'm your host, Neeraj Shah. The Talking Point today is to try and assess what the impact on a certain sect of the NBFCs could be, namely the housing finance companies. Now, most people that I speak to and most brokerage notes that I read seem to suggest that the housing finance space is probably the best or the relatively the better placed one in the list of NBFCs that get impacted due to the moratorium and the risk of the rising NPAs that lurks ahead. We do not know for sure but it seems a probability. The question though is, or, or the counter to that, is also the soft real estate demand and could that hit the basic inherent demand curve that the housing finance companies have seen all through the last few years. So to throw more light on this about the sector and then of course the individual companies as well, we start off the conversation with Kapish Jain of PNB Housing Finance. He joins us right now on the show to talk about his company and his thoughts on the space. And post this conversation, we'll also have Canfin Homes uh, try and dwell some light on that as well. Kapish, so good having you. Thanks much for taking the yeah. time out and speaking to us. Um, hope all is safe. Absolutely fine. Thank you. That's good. What are the challenges of the lockdown and the realities of the post-COVID world, Kapish? I mean, everybody's been debating endlessly about uh, what the moratoriums mean for different entities. But I'm guessing the real truth would be, or the proof of the pudding would be, post the moratoriums end, and the ugly face of the NPAs, if they were to come to the fourth, would come about. Yeah, you know, the challenges of lockdown is uncertainty. We, we does not know how things are going to span out, how things will unshape. And uh, therefore, it's difficult to plan yourself and you need to have multiple options ready for yourself to be better prepared. So one challenge of lockdown is that it's difficult to connect with your stakeholders. It's difficult to operationally work in the right way. And this is still a touch and feel business. You just can't do everything online because the registration has to happen at the place. The legal technical has to happen at the venue of the customer who's buying the property. So some of these issues really make a challenge for you to operate uh, fully operational seamlessly. And we are trying to just see how we can best manage it. Uh, and uh, on your point of moratorium, uh, it's about education. You know, If you just see the trend, our own trend, our own trend is suggesting that the moratorium availed under moratorium two, which came in subsequent to the moratorium one, is far lower. So people are realizing that they are not benefiting by availing moratorium. They would only be postponing their commitments and their, their tenure of loan will only get extended multitude. And therefore, it's all about giving them the education and the learning. Uh, it was, you need to segment it between whether it's for a housing finance or a CV finance or a microfinance. Because housing finance, as you rightly mentioned, is the most secure asset. Because uh, it's, it's, it's always proven that the housing finance is first on the priority to, pay, to make payment for. Because people have a high property value compared to the loan that they hold. And therefore, they don't want to just default on that particular payment. And uh, in the in the last six months, people have also cut down on their expenses. Expenses any which ways have come down. So therefore, the savings have been built up as well. So I don't really see it's going to be a major concern coming in, particularly for the housing sector on the salaried class to start paying their liability once the moratorium is over. Hmm. What's your sense of what kind of asset quality issues could come up for you and for the space at large? Because while, yes, it is true that housing is probably the most secured, um, would it escape unscathed completely or could there be issues and could there be issues of a larger nature? Too? No, no. So, so as, as I said, you know, you're right. So housing would escape the entire concern coming from the sector because the housing sector, more particularly the home loan sector and even then the salaried sector, uh, even the current trend that is suggesting for us is showing that the collection is becoming more healthier every single month. And uh, so, but then if you segment the sector between a housing product and a non-housing product, which could be a lab product or a corporate developer product, then again, these three would show different colors. Even the moratorium is showing different colors. So you need to see how you manage each of them separately and have different strategy to manage them. Uh, but on the flip side, if you notice, the real estate has been on a seven-year slump. The CAGR for seven years is around 2%. Uh, and therefore, the affordability index, I would presume, is at a decade high or even higher, uh, which means that there's enough room available in the property value now after all the bend down that has happened but it still gives you enough safe measures in terms in the form of the loan to value where a person would be there to pay his liability because the asset value is still higher than what he's owning as a liability uh, given the whole meltdown that happened in the property value itself. So that way I would presume that the sector is far more safer compared to many of the other sectors. In, in your conversation over the last two, three months with the brokerages, fund managers, etc. Do you sense a tilt in the minds of investors uh, in, in terms of at least uh, in the housing finance space towards uh, those companies which have got a higher proportion of salaried class 
people as their customers is the, is there a till that you sense yeah so so that that's that's true actually because uh, if you are in a salaried sector uh, it won't be a widespread impact in a self employed sector it's your business your operations and therefore your cash flow which gets impacted in your ability to service those loans uh, but if you are in a salaried sector you still be getting some salary there could be some cuts happening across but you'll still be able to manage your key liabilities and as i, as I mentioned among the list of liabilities the most priority liability that somebody would like to service is a home loan and that's where you are the safest on the ladder to get your money back and that's precisely why it's viewed that the home loan and the salary sector is the safest but if you if you just talk about us we are in, we are also in the self employed segment almost 50% of ours is in the salary segment the second class is in the self employed segment but in the self employed segment the loan to value is far higher our loan to value is around 48% which means it gives me enough cushion uh from a property cover perspective to safeguard myself in any potential credit leakages which can happen uh so that's the second safeguard that you get from the self employed but on a broader perspective people do prefer that the most safest haven is the salary segment uh from a recovery perspective mm. abhish a couple of uh, uh points that some research houses have brought out and i would love your thoughts here one of the notes states that in terms of individual companies barring pnb housing all other hfcs have claimed a lower moratorium and for pnb housing too this number is higher owing to the developer portfolio uh, what would your response be to this because almost i i must tell you all the conversations that i have had with market men on talking point in portfolio managers or otherwise they are all worried about this one particular piece for the space at large which is companies which have a higher proportion of the developer loan portfolio because that may be at higher risk than as you said salaried people giving in the money how would you respond to this yeah so uh, now i don't know from where the data came in but the data may not got updated might not have got updated with the second morad data right in the first morad data our uh, our share on the morad avail uh, availment was around 50% but in the second morad which came in it dropped to around 39% it dropped significantly and more particularly it dropped in the individual retail segment in retail segment it went to as low as 29% uh, it was all because uh, a lot of awareness got created where we connected with our customers through our technology one on one gave them more specific illustration to make them understand that not by paying two months of emi their loan actually extends around six months and eight months and that's where the realization came in that is better that they service their loan so we think that it it it's still it's now in line with what the industry would be if not better uh, more so on the retail segment which is the lion's share of our book so yes there could be players who have a far higher proportion of wholesale book or the corporate assets where they might find challenges but ours is around 82% is in the retail segment so we are relatively better uh, compared to many of the other players uh, as far the developers are concerned there again we deal with the top developers we deal with the type a developers who are in the top notch and therefore they have enough liquidity and they have enough support available from their own uh, corporate sending perspective to be able to service their loan so there again while there are developers and most developers have available for moratorium in terms of ability to service uh, uh, should be still better Uh, given the segment where we operate in the developer segment mm. has historically it been that way again because uh, i mean if i just look at the gross npas and please correct me if i'm wrong here kapish but it may not be higher double digits but it's certainly not lower single digits as well your npas that have stemmed from the developer loan portfolio right am i wrong and 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 yeah. again if that is the case uh, how is one to predict what could happen ahead considering the times are just so uncertain what makes you confident that this asset quality from this particular portfolio will not spike the asset quality concerns will not spike so you know the neera if you were even talking us over the last couple of years or 18 months at least we have completely stalled any new fresh line of disbursement in the corporate sector it's a dual mm. percent so that's mm. one way to stop any kind of asset quality fall uh, the second thing that we are doing is we are selling our portfolio on the corporate asset in the whole of fi20 we sold around 2300 crore so the the mere number of wholesale segment or the developer segment book has come down from around 18000 to 14000 today we won't be disbursing any more in this segment at least for the foreseeable future and we also intend to sell we are in a advanced stage conversation of selling some portion of this asset in the next uh, couple of or next few weeks uh, that will also stop any kind of further deterioration npa per se is a percentage between a numerator and a denominator right so the lower the denominator and the numerator stays where it is this percentage might look has a higher number but we are very confident that given that we are not adding any new asset in that portfolio and uh, we only have a limited number of asset which are currently under concern which needs to be addressed 
And we have a crack team, which we call the remediation team, which is working on these to resolve them uh, 24 by 7. So we believe that we should be able to resolve them uh, in, in the next, maybe in this fiscal or, or sooner. Uh, the assets that we have considered, and there are not too many of them. There are around four or five of them, uh, which you need to resolve collectively. So you, you don't think it could be a problem? Okay. Uh, fair and comment. Particularly, Neeraj, it's, as I mentioned, it's difficult to foresee how COVID will unturn, right? But two, three indicators which suggest is that uh, the real estate sector is at an all-time seven-year low, so there's enough affordability which has come up. Uh, there's enough measures that the government has also announced, the benefit which is available to the developers in the affordable segment to get a through tax-free kind of a benefit. Are all add-ons is going to make some differences in the entire span. So you don't reckon your asset quality uh, uh, numbers could show a sharp deterioration going ahead. No, I, 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 it's difficult to predict that, so I commit, I can't commit on that, and I'm sure. But the one important thing which you need to always make sure is to make sure that you have adequate coverage available for your bad quality assets, which is called the, mm. the provisions, right? Our provisions, if you compare for anybody and the best of the place in the market, our provision in the real estate corporate asset size is 100%, so which means we have provided okay. for all the bad apples that we have in our portfolio. On the retail side, our provision is 87%. With the kind of asset quality that we have maintained in the retail, uh, it's more than adequate and very, very conservative that we have provided. Even then, the balance sheet is at around capital adequacy of 18%. The requirement is 14% from a regulator perspective. Mm -hmm. Our gearing is comfortable. So we have made sure that we are strengthening the balance sheet to take care of any concerns which can come in the future. Uh, but And that way, right. we are confident, given that we are focused is to see how we resolve these cases. Uh, beyond that, it's difficult to predict. But we are, we are sure that we whatever comes our way, we'll be able to resolve them in the, in the right way. Yeah. We'll also get in Mr. Uh, uh, we'll also get in Mr. Kosgi in this conversation. Girish Kosgi, MD of Campbell Homes, in just a moment from now, in fact, joining us as well. But uh, final question to you, Kapish, uh, and and let's get in Mr. Kosgi in this conversation as well because I want to hear this as well, and then kind of carry on that line of conversation with him. But uh, Kapish, final question to you: uh, How is the quarter gone by been for you? I know you can't give exact numbers. I wouldn't want that as well. But can you give us a brief outline? Yeah, so we actually gave a press release. So I can share to the extent that we gave and mentioned in the press release. Uh, we disbursed for the quarter around 800 crore, and the numbers have jumped up between the last first one of the quarter to the last one of the quarter, which means that the signs of economy moving up and, and, and opening up. Uh, and the quarter per se has been fine uh, because of moratorium. Uh, the runoffs have been lower, the assets have held itself fine. And uh, we have worked hard on two particular elements one is on our liquidity, and second is on our collection, which is the recovery. Uh, so our, our liquidity is fairly comfortable. We are sitting on liquidity, which is around 10,000 plus as of today, and which is very, very important. The two very prominent things that you need to make sure in this particular times is your liquidity and your capital. And these are two things that we are working, and the quarter per se has been fairly good. And we are looking forward to the lockdown moving out and economy going back to a shape sooner. Okay, Kapich, we'll, we'll leave uh, this conversation and that with you. Thank you so much for taking the time out and speaking to us today on Talk Pleasure. Talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. All right. And and in fact, continuing that theme, let's get in Mr. Girish Kausgi as well. Uh, 